Bingo, we're back for the first show of the week. Uh, it's Monday, uh, it's 12 o'clock rock, I'm Jay Fidel. We're beginning another broadcast week with uh, Think Tech Hawaii, we're so happy to do that. From our downtown studios in the core of downtown here in Pioneer Plaza. Uh, so uh, we have, of course, Mina Marita. Uh, it's, it's called Mina, Marco, Mina, and me, uh, except Marco is not available right now. Um, so we're calling this show Mina and Me Alone at Last. Hi, Mina. It's nice to be alone <laughs> with you. <laughs> Hi, Jay. Nice talking alone with you. <laughs> um, and if you didn't know, Mina Marita, former chair of the Public Utilities Commission in Hawaii, and now a blogger and an energy consultant and thinker with energydynamics.com. So, so much is happening in energy. It's, it's hard to get our hands around it every single week, but I love trying. And uh, I guess yeah. the, the big news, Mina, is uh, what in the world is going on with Sun Edison uh, and these uh, not one, not two, but three uh, PV farms, facilities that they have been building over the past, what, couple of years. They've, uh, they've um, uh, installed hundreds of thousands of cell units. Um, it's a huge project. Uh, and uh, HECO canceled it a couple of weeks ago, and, and now we're having the implications. Uh, there's um, all kinds of efforts by Sun Edison to change that. Um, and you wrote a blog about it, and I would really like to hear your thoughts about whether HECO was right, uh, you know, in the larger sense, about terminating these, these three uh, PB projects. Yeah, I last Sunday, so over a week ago, I wrote a blog called Current Eco Bashing Unwarranted um, regarding the cancellation of the um, power purchase agreement. And mainly, you know, if you look at what's happening to Sun Edison, you know, they're, they're stuck in the last, um, especially the last six months have been plummeting. And they get, it, there was a little uptick last week from um, a dismissal of an injunction on one of their acquisitions. And so the stock bounced up a little bit, but not too much. Um, but they're not in good financial condition. And so according to Hawaiian Electric, with regard to um, power purchase agreements, they've missed some milestones. Um, in their contract, and uh, by missing the, these milestones, Hawaiian Electric um, has an opportunity to cancel the contract. And I, I given the financial situation of Sun Edison, I think it was a wild, uh, a wise decision to get out of it. Should Sun Edison go into bankruptcy because um, if these projects get tied up in bankruptcy, they'll be sitting there until it gets resolved, taking up capacity on the grid. And who knows how long that would take. But the biggest criticism of, of HECO and canceling the contract is um, some people said that they had a uh, prospective buyer, and the prospective buyer was D.E. Shaw, Northwestern University, um, and Madison Dearborn Partners. But what was never discussed in the press was that um, this group or this hui of prospective buyers are creditors of um, Sun Edison. And the deal was structured where um, they were offering to cancel some of some some of Sun Edison's debt in exchange for developing projects like the ones in Hawaii, and sh and taking shares in Sun Edison's um, yield code called Terraform, and and so. Um, here you have a group holding something like 330 something million dollars of debt. And what the 
consumer advocate pointed out in its filing in the PUC is we have to be really careful here because um, should it fall into bankruptcy, the trustee will look back to see if there were any favorable terms given to creditors. And and so even though you have a per, prospective um, buyer, it's not a arm's length transaction. So yeah, it's a, you know, it'd be avoidable preference is what it would be, and the bankruptcy court would look back. 90 days to see uh -huh. whether there were any voidable preferences and if it felt that this was a voidable preference they would you know they would reverse that preference uh yeah but, but you know i mean this this must be a, a, of enormous uh, detriment to tucson edison i mean they, they've lost a huge set of contracts here after you know not only incurring debt but probably putting in a lot of cash uh to build it right. as far as it you know it's half built or more and so this is really going to be a problem because if, you know, their, their board of directors, uh, their other creditors, uh, their stockholders, for example, are going to say, whoops, right. this isn't viable. And so it seems to me that from what you've described, there's a fair chance of bankruptcy. And the bankruptcy, uh, if the bankruptcy is within, what is it, 90 days, I think, um, of the, yeah. you know, of the, uh, of, of the cancellation, we still have a couple of months to go on that. Uh, then right. the whole cancellation is going to be stopped uh, by the automatic stay, and the cancellation will right. not be effective, and the thing will get thrown into, you know, a determination by the bankruptcy court anyway, uh, which could last mm -hmm. a long time. You know, it's interesting, uh, Mina, that, you know, in the energy history of Hawaii, uh, we haven't had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, profound bankruptcies, bankruptcies that affected... Right. Big money, big projects, a lot of people, and in fact, you know the right. uh, you know the generation capacity of the state. Uh, this one could yeah. be exactly that. This could be an unprecedented and uh, damaging bankruptcy uh, that would affect the initiative. I don't think people realize that. It must have been a very right. hard decision for Hawaiian Electric. Yeah, because you know they were damned if they did and damned if they don't, right? Yes. But you know, the, the, I think they had to. Um, you know, really look at this, you know, if this was the only time out for them by um, the missed milestones, I think they had to take the, that opportunity to um, protect not only the company, but also um, protecting ratepayers and our whole policy of moving forward. Um, yeah, with, exactly. And, you know, you know, you're right about damned if you do, damned if you don't. If Hawaiian Electric did not cancel and they, mm -hmm. these guys went into bankruptcy um, shortly thereafter, everybody would be complaining that Hawaiian Electric should have canceled. <laughs> you know, so yeah. how can you win this? Right. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, that, that was the basis for me saying that this criticism is unwarranted because when you dig deeper... It's like, boy, this is a real precarious situation right here that could tie up the state for months, years, who knows? Yeah, and may tie and up the I state for months, years anyway. So. Yeah, and I think with the per prospective buyer, it'll be interesting to see if, um, if they were willing to offer in this new negotiation a out clause for Hawaiian Electric, should it fall into bankruptcy. So the, uh, giving, giving Hawaiian Electric a right to terminate should, should the worst case scenario happen. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh -huh. and maybe this is all part of a, a kind of, uh, uh, you know, n negotiation. Maybe all these moves, these milestone problems and the cancellation, it's yeah. all part of a larger business negotiation. So to immediately uh, jump on HECO for terminating is, it seems unfair. And what it suggests to me is that, uh, you know, the media and uh, other members of the uh, energy community are simply not sympathetic to HECO. Uh, they take every right. opportunity to knock on HECO. It's a credibility issue for them. They take advantage of that. Right. Um, and and right. in fact, uh, you know, there are, there are many issues. This is a very complex decision. Um, that do compel 
exactly what HECO did. So I agree with your blog on this, Mina. Yeah, yeah, and apparently a lot of people, first of all, have been reading it and, and seem, seems to be agreeable, and especially people who understand um, what could happen in the event of bankruptcy. Yeah. So you've got a lot of big numbers on this. You, this was uh, this went viral, eh? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, you know, I think we have the to be. The largest numbers I see so far. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. I, you're a real uh, positive uh, element in in the conversation. I I think it's really important that we hear from you, and I certainly appreciate you writing the blog and taking positions and you bring a lot to the table, a lot of experience, a lot of knowledge, all of your years in the legislature and the PUC. Uh, so we should be listening to you. And, and uh, what, what strikes me is that, um, you know, sometimes I think uh, the press and I say the other members of the uh, energy community who have some sort of business beef with HECO, they really don't give it a fair shake. And uh, your right. blog and your, your thought process on this, your, you know, your, your, your point of view is, uh, is fair, impartial, and, and very helpful, and I think we should all be reading and considering what you do. So energydynamics.com, right? Yeah, so thank you. I really appreciate that. But, yeah, I, I mean, the reason I started the blog was just to kind of bring balance to the conversation, and especially as we get into more complex issues, because, you know, early on, the emphasis has been on generation and renewable gen renewable energy generation, but we're looking at an entire energy system and the transformation of this entire energy system. So, you know, the renewable generation is just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah, and it gets one bigger. Piece of the pie. It gets bigger, it gets more complex, there's more capital involved in every stroke of it. Um, I don't think people realize this is not mom and pop anymore. It cannot be. We're now in a position where yeah. we have to spend hundreds of millions for every significant step forward. And that, and that is complex. Right. Complex in raising the money, complex in planning the project, executing the plot project, and, and dealing with the government. And in this case, by the way, I, mm -hmm. I recall that, there's, that the Sun Edison guys filed an application with the PUC to reverse the cancellation. What, what prospect right. do you think that has of success at the PUC? I, you know, it's really hard to tell. I mean, I think, um, you know, as, as a former regulator, I, it's really hard to force, you don't want to force, you don't want to override a business decision. Yes. Right. And, um, you know, if, if this goes farther south, you know, it will be Hawaiian Electric holding all the risk, holding the bag. Everybody else gets to walk away from it. Now, that would seem very unfair and because at the end of the day, Hawaiian Electric is a, is a, is a business corporation. It's a, it's a utility, but it's also a business corporation. And if it makes a decision... Yeah as it did in this case, to yeah. pr preserve its own assets and minimize its own liabilities, then it seems very unfair for regulators to say, no, you take the risk. No, you, you have mm -hmm. to walk into the valley of the shadow of death and see what happens. <laughs> right. And, you know, the interesting thing that the consumer advocate pointed out, and I don't believe this is kind of general knowledge, is that there were actually seven... Um, utility scale solar projects that HECO went in for approval and you know um, they went with seven seeking diversity amongst all the developers but the PUC didn't approve the other projects so the bulk of the projects landed with Sun Edison. So this is one of the problems, you know, here we're moving to cost-effective solar utility scale projects that can um, help lower costs, but all of the projects are being done by one developer. Yeah, so we, so that, yeah, we, we, we would have had a yeah. diversified array 
of projects. Now it's all focused on one developer, and then so the risk is focused on the one developer. That that right. limited HECO's uh, opportunity to uh, distribute the risk. Yeah. Right. Exactly, and that that was that distribution was denied <laughs> through yeah. a PUC decision, and 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 I think that's what people need to understand as we move forward. One of the reasons for the renewable portfolio standards is to develop a portfolio of diverse resources um, so you can balance risk. See, that's so important. You know, so, yeah. That's so, an important you know, point. It, it's, not, it's not we solve 100% with solar. It yeah. has to be diversified. Yeah. yeah. And this whole thing with Sun Edison, just whatever happens here, it points out that there is business risk in everything we do. And as we take on bigger projects, that risk includes, it increases. And so we have got to make mm -hmm. important business decisions, um, you know, with the best thinking we can get. And the regulators should respect uh, the utility company, um, you know, to make those decisions within its, you know, its business acumen. Uh, let's take a, a short right. break, a short break, uh, Mina, and then we'll come back. That's Mina Morita. This is usually uh, Marco, Mina Morita, and me on Monday at noon. But today, Marco is busy at the, uh, the Next Era hearings, as I recall. So it's Mina Morita, uh -huh. Mina and me alone at last. We can take a short break. Right <laughs> Aloha. Hello, my name is Patrick Bratton. I'm host of Global Connections here at ThinkTech Hawaii. We broadcast live every Thursday at 1 p.m. We bring Hawaii to the world and the world to Hawaii, talking about international events and various things of interest to the audience. Please join me. I look forward to talking with you and having you get, get to meet some of my guests. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, and I'm the host of Sustainable Hawaii at thinktechhawaii.com. We air live on the internet and also on Oceanic Channel 16. I would invite you to come for a fresh new show every Tuesday from 12 to 1 o'clock. I try to bring on guests that give us a different viewpoint on aspects of sustainability in Hawaii, as well as trying to unpack some of the difficult concepts of measuring and achieving sustainability, particularly with regard to sustainable economic growth and prosperity in Hawaii. Please join us every Tuesday from 12 to 1 p.m. Mahalo, aloha. Well, we're back, we're live, we're here with Mina Marita. It's uh, not Mina, Marco and me, or Marco, Mina and me, I'm getting confused. It's Mina and me alone at last. I am so enjoying this. Thank you for joining me even Alone at last, Mina. Thank you, Jay. So anyway, so uh, talking about blogs, you have another one in the pipeline. What's that about? Well, one of the uh, big um, issues that Sun Edison had was one of their investors. Um, a minority investor in a Sun Edison um, subsidiary. Oh, is it a subsidiary? Anyway, it's a yield code called Terraform. Mm -hmm. And so what Sun Edison has been doing is they develop these projects um, uh, generating conventional or renewable long-term um, contracted operating assets mm -hmm. that generate a predictable cash flow. Mm -hmm. And what they do in these yield codes is they um, make a cash distribution to their shareholders uh, quarterly or annual dividends they pay out. So they build this generating unit. It can be renewable or it can be a conventional generator. Um, all the revenues that are generated for it um, is an attractive investment, and it gets paid out through dividends. Mm -hmm. So this hedge company called Appaloosa, um, owned by a billionaire named Kepler, 
he challenged Sun Edison's acquisition of Vivint. And, you know, Vivint does a lot of business in Hawaii. Yes. And, and he, his, um, he asserted that the Vivint type projects, you know, the, the residential rooftop projects. Yes. Should not be included in the terraform portfolio, and uh, basically because they're too risky. Mm -hmm. And and then the other thing he was concerned of is um, the Vivint acquisition was something like 1.9 billion dollars, and so Sun Edison was going to throw all this debt into the terraform. Um, balance sheet and so he had filed for an injunction against the acquisition and on Thursday a Delaware judge um, uh, dismissed the, the motion for the, the um, injunction but what was interesting was the judge said that um, well, he wasn't going to file the, uh, allow the injunction to go through. He had some concerns about um, the purchase and whether the purchase was fair to all of the minority investors because Sun Edison, as a parent company, holds the majority of shares. And what Sun Edison did was they threw off all the board directors that didn't agree with the acquisition. So the judge was um, looking at that and saying, he, he, um, he thought that was, um, that raised some concerns. Yeah. So what's your uh, reaction to all of that, Mina? Well, I think, you know, Marco and I have been talking about the third-party financing model. And so I think this sort of brings that whole model, again, back into question when you have people um, um, concerned about that type of revenue stream, and um, which is interesting. It's kind of complicated, but, but it's interesting because... That revenue stream is highly dependent on net metering. And net metering is not a contract. Net metering is a tariff. And Which could tariff be changed on a dime, yeah. Right, right. Where what's typical in the yield coal are our purchase agreements where the off taker is the utility and those power purchase agreements are contracts. And, and, and so, you know, in this new code, that they're mixing up both. And, and so apparently this investor is looking at, at that and, you know, has made a, um, a determination that, you know, this is risky here and yeah. it shouldn't be here. This sounds like the housing mm -hmm. crisis of 2008, um, you know, you, you have... Uh, funny debt instruments, um, you have uh, credit extended where it should not be, you have all these creative creative debt arrangements, and then one day they collapse. Uh, and right. And, and so what, yeah, and so what Vivint is doing is, you know, right now, well, I'm sorry, not Vivint, but Solar City, what they're doing is they're bundling all of these third-party finance, um, financing leases with rooftop solar, solar customers and selling it as um, securitized debt or um, securitized um, bonds, securitized bonds um, to raise money. Well, now, let me, let me throw this in the pot, though. If somebody uh, has a good mortgage payment record, and um, mm -hmm. now this, this essentially, uh, when you say securitized, it's securitized against the real property 
I think in a lot of cases, right? And the, the homeowner right. is, uh, has given a, a real estate interest in, in security for the, you know, the, the, the loan um, for the uh, mm -hmm. PV installation. Then th that, right. that should be fairly secure if the property owner is going to pay the first mortgage not likely he's going to lose his house over a twenty or thirty dollar second, a twenty thousand thirty, a twenty or thirty thousand dollar second mortgage. Um, but I mean, right. are we saying here that it's that this is not secure? That these kinds of loans uh, may fail? That there may be mortgage foreclosures on the securitized, uh, you know, PV contracts? Well, I, I think the only thing that I could say right now is. You know, these power purchase agreements, which are agreements between um, the financing party, like Solar City and Vivint and um, Sunrun, are agreements between the customer and the financing party, right? Yeah. Where in a yield call, these were agreements or contracts between, for example, the independent power producer and the utility with the utility as the off taker at a contracted price. Yeah. And, and so I think this is why the net nearing um, issue across the country is going berserk right now, especially in Nevada um, with the regulator not even allowing for grandfathering interesting because it affects yeah. it affects the third party the viability of the third party um uh, yeah. financing arrangement yeah uh-huh so when, when's your blog coming out on this i i, I want to read it but i think this is a, an important issue probably in a day or two good we'll be looking energydynamics.com and what it, what it shows me, Mina, is that, again, as we you get more sophisticated, as more complexity in, in finding, you know, a, a reliable portfolio, uh, that these things are going to come up. And Hawaii, uh, it might have started out with a lot of local producers. That's really not the case anymore. The mainland is here. Foreign investment, however it's bundled, is here. And we are part of a national network, a mesh of companies and operators and debt and we can't really avoid and oh i might add litigation so we're part of a, yeah. a national a national melee here of all kinds of new yeah. things that are being created in the business markets and so uh, we'll, we're subject to that and we have to be as i've always said we have to be careful about managing foreign investment uh, and this is just mm -hmm. another example of that. Amina, let's take a break. We'll be right back okay. and we'll talk some more about this and we'll talk about LNG, uh, which is, uh, you know, a, a favorite subject these days. Uh, that's <laughs> Mina Marina and Alone at Last. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Come join us every Friday at 2 p.m. when I interview interesting scientists about what they do, why they do it, and why we should all care about it. It's a lot of fun to see. We hear, and you can learn interesting stuff. You'll hear all kinds of fascinating science, and we know you'll have a great time. Hope to see you then. Bye-bye. Aloha, namaskar, and hello. My name is Anu Hittel, and I host the show called Climate Change Beyond Outrage. We go beyond outrage, to find solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I hope you will join me here every Tuesday at 1 o'clock. We broadcast live from thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha and bye-bye. <laughs> okay, we're back. We're live. And Mina and I have had a very interesting revelation uh, over the break that, that, we'll, that she's wrestling with in creating her, her forthcoming blog. So, Mina, can you, can you go through that? It's a, it's a question of the ownership of these big national uh, PV renewable companies. Uh, who are they and what, and what is remarkable about that? Well, so, so uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, everybody is against 
the utility because you're the, the big, huge corporate giant. So, but if you look at the investors in the Sun Edison, Sun Run, Solar City um, business, these are all hedge funds, institutional investors. I mean, both sides, utility side, solar side, they're all the same investors <laughs> playing against each other. <laughs> So deja vu all over again. So, yeah, you know, I, it goes you know, to the big money. At the end of the day, it goes to the big money. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants to talk about the democratization of, of um, uh, you know, solar brings, brings, has the advantage of uh, democratizing power. I don't see it here because it's the same big Wall Street on both sides. Yeah, and, and, and that's what's happened. You know, it was mom and pop at first, local company, <clears throat> you know, buying panels, installing panels, and it was like a fee simple transaction. There was no financing involved. All of a sudden, financing, and then national companies coming with new financing products. It made it easier to get the PV on your roof, but, you know, after a time, they're going to securitize that, that arrangement. Then, you know, the PV belongs to them. And, and so what you have now is, you know, we are swept into something that is not so democratized at all. And it's owned or leased no. and handled by large companies yes. elsewhere. E exactly. So this whole huge utility solar debate that's going on nationally, they're both owned by the same investors. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all Wall Street driven. I, I'm more except, and more, I'm going to read your blog. Regu i gotta, I got to see you play this out. the other side's not. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> this is so important to watch this stuff. You know, energy is yeah. so exciting. And, and uh, just when we thought we had enough confusion in the local market, we find that we're not really limited to the local market. We're part of the national market. And there's plenty of confusion in the national market. We all have to stay Akamai about this. But let's talk about yeah. LNG, because LNG has been a subject uh, on our talk shows, on our Hawaii, uh, Hawaii uh, uh, Wednesday energy shows. That is Hawaii, the state of clean energy shows uh, run by the Energy Policy Forum uh, for the past couple of weeks. And there'll be more all about LNG. And there's so much in the media in Civil Beat, Hawaii News Now about LNG. <clears throat> Hawaii Gas is generating a lot of uh, conversation about it. And, uh, you know, uh, here to say that uh, Hawaiian Electric is also talking about their plans for it. And I think that the conversation was dormant for a while, but it's now very active. And you wrote a blog mm -hmm. a few months ago about, about the governor's statement. He didn't like LNG, which I think has, uh, has had a, an effect on the people who work for him. A lot of them, are, you know, in, in DBED and, and all that, um, they are a little reluctant to get out there and and uh, uh, advocate for LNG when the governor has taken that position. So what was your blog on the point? What was your ultimate conclusion on it? And where are you now, a few months later, with all this you know, renewed conversation over LNG? Well, first of all, you know, um, the avid um, renewable energy proponents keep making this an LNG versus renewable issue. And I think framing it that way is wrong. This is an LNG versus oil issue. You know, and, and we're not going to get off of fossil fuels in the near future. You know, this is an evolution that's going to take, you know, 20, 30 years out. And, um, and we're looking for fuels, again, a diversity of fuels that can um, be competitive, cleaner burning, and um, help move the, the needle for us towards a, um, uh, towards emissions reduction. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's a point that we all have to consider. This isn't a, a renewable energy versus LNG debate. This is an LNG versus oil debate. Well, you know, my, my concern, and I expressed it on the, the show, well, on, 
uh, yeah, on the show last Wednesday, which featured um, Barbara Treat of Hawaii Gas. She's their project manager for LNG. Uh, she's a very experienced uh -huh. woman, a real executive. <clears throat> Richard uh, Walsgrove from uh, Blue Planet, uh, you know, who has uh, customarily opposed LNG. Um, right. Although he, he was a very agreeable guest, I think. And, and John Cole, a uh, former PUC commissioner, under, under you, right. no, under you. Uh, yeah, and he, John was also a consumer advocate. Yes, and, uh, and mm -hmm. more recently now he's with HNEI, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, which is part of UH. And um, mm -hmm. so, the, you know, the three of them had a conversation, and, um, you know, Barbara was uh, explaining and advancing uh, LNG, Richard had his concerns about it, uh, and John was saying pretty much what you're saying that we we have to we have to consider it, include it. Uh, but my mm -hmm. question is, you know, we've had this conversation on and off for probably, hmm, gee whiz, four or five years altogether, and we're still right. in conversation. And you know, people right. people say like, oh, we have to have this conversation. Well, when do we get to the action part? I mean, how long does the conversation it, 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 go before you actually do something or make a decision one way or the other? Right, and and that's why I took issue with the governor's pronouncement about LNG because it was made without any um, factual basis. You know, there was no no analysis behind it because you know from various resources. You, you you saw that there were clear advantages in moving in this direction, and then and then you have the governor coming out with a, a pronouncement, which puts a stop everywhere, especially deep in as the um, energy planner, um, with without any real justification, and and you know here. Everyone was trying to be very analytical and taking a careful look as to um, cost benefit of of LNG and how to address things like um, uh, clear clean air, clean air regulation, which has huge costs mm -hmm. to um, eco in either bringing on new generators or retrofitting old generators yeah, yeah. Or, or fuel substitution. Yeah. You know, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars there. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so you know, who, who leads the charge on this to make something move ahead? I mean, I, I think the governor has, like, disqualified himself by taking this position. He's certainly not the one going to lead the charge. And, and by the way, let me add that in making that pronouncement, he was not making a legal ruling. It's not his jurisdiction to do, <laughs> not his power to do that. Right. He was just, right. uh, you know, voicing what, what amounts to an um, unauthorized view. I mean, it's a, view, it's a personal view almost. So let's assume right. that, the, that the right decision is to move ahead. Let's assume that for a minute on LNG. Who gets to move right. it? I, Who is the I, proactive I, party? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's why, you know, there's, there's a, a barrier here because DBED as the energy planner needs to take an active role in this because if you move to LNG, it's going to affect the viability of the refinery. You know, it, it's going to affect the harbor infrastructure in how you deal with different fuels. And, you know, the, 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 the administration has a critical role to play in this. Yes. And, and to facilitate. And, you know, it's not only about electrical generation. It, it's about um, touching on marine um, fuels, touching on, on uh, ground transportation fuels. It, it, it touches on... An, uh, synthetic natural gas replacement, you know, because we use SNG now um, and some LNG for 
um, heating and cooking needs. Mm -hmm. and, and especially for um, large commercial establishments like restaurants, hotels, uh, you, you know, so really important economic issues that, that um, have to be considered, just not solely about electricity generation. So have you, have you got a feeling for where this is going to go, in fact? What, you have a prediction on how this issue is ultimately going to be treated here in the next, uh, whatever the active period would be, a couple of years. Are we going to make a decision? Do we have to wait for the next administration? Do we have to create an, a, another government agency to, 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 you know, get down on it and do something? Well, what's your prediction? Well, I, yeah, if we don't make a decision soon about bringing in bulk LNG, we're going to be limited to bring in containerized LNG. And, you know, that's just not um, efficient. You know, if we want to get the cost benefit, we have to deliver it here as efficiently as possible, mm -hmm. and that's through bulk shipment. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are other options, like the containerized option, but, again, we're not, you know, w w pricing-wise, a whole lot more expensive to do. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there, Mina. We're out of time. But thank you so much for joining me privately in this way, Mina, Mina Marita and me alone at last. I really appreciate that. And uh, no, when, when uh, Marco comes back, he's, he's, in, he's in the final hours of the, um, the, the next era hearings at the PUC. When he comes back, we can get him to uh, give us a, a report about that. And I, and I hope that's soon. Two weeks from now, Mina, right? Yeah, yes. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Aloha. Okay, thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.